Penn State On Demand is a service of Penn State Public Broadcasting, and now you can support WPSU when you shop online. Visit wpsu.org slash shop to make purchases from national online retailers, and WPSU will receive a portion of the sale with no extra cost to you. So start your online shopping at wpsu.org slash shop. I do some consulting work on the American feeling in the room was You don't ever say to her that what about the shock when she was in the United States. This is called Life and Services. We left. We were a community for China to back over. doing in autism. The World in Conversation Project relies on student facilitators and the Socratic method to generate candid dialogue on some of today's most difficult social issues, from race to the Middle East to college drinking culture. Penn State sociology lecturers Sam Richards and Lori Mulvey co-direct the project. They also happen to be married. We'll talk with Richards and Mulvey about the World in Conversation Project, about what drives their race relations work, and about why it's sometimes necessary to break the rules in order to break down barriers. Here's our conversation with Sam Richards and Lori Mulvey. Sam Richards and Lori Mulvey, welcome to the conversation. Thanks for having Thank us. Thank you. Let's start by telling us a little bit about this project uh, that you co-direct called The World in Conversation. When I think world in conversation, I think of a space and an idea. And, the, and both of those, they kind of come together um, in what our mission is, and that's really to try to create a neutral space for dialogue. Neutral being um, a kind of space where any perspective can be welcomed into the conversation. Um, we, we like to say that none of our facilitators are neutral or there's no neutral people, but we try to create an atmosphere where people feel like there's no right answer. And so that's what we're doing. And so when you say facilitator, you're talking about one of the, the biggest classes at Penn State, one of the most popular classes at Penn State. It started off as the Race Relations Project. Um, and by facilitators, you mean people that you have trained to help get conversations about pressing social issues started. Mm -hmm. Tell us about these uh, facilitators. Well, we, it's a class of 725 students and it's broken into 48 discussion groups. And so each semester we're able to search out um, in, within that population 32 students who the following semester will become discussion group leaders for the class, for the future students. And so it's kind of nice that we have so many people to pick from to, to find those, those who really enjoy conversation and believe in conversation and dialogue and like to ask questions rather than teach. So we're working with undergrads and then what we do is of the 32, they go through a, a semester's worth of work with us and then they go through further training and, and a selection process and then we pick out about eight to 10 each semester who will join the World in Conversation project. I think part of the beauty of this and part of the, the enormous attraction of all of this is that everyone, including the two of you, are both teachers and students. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. At all times. <laughs> yeah, I find it's just when I know, me personally, because I do a lot of facilitation as well, just when I feel like I'm following a line of thinking that, and I think I know where it's going, it goes in a completely different direction, and I am so often humbled by what I hear. In fact, that's why I stopped being the person standing up in front of the classroom, because I realized that everyone in this room has something to share that I don't know about. Uh, it's, it's interesting, too, to note how the two of you came to this. Um, here you are teaching probably the most popular, the largest uh, race class in the country. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you came to it, it's, a, it's a, an interesting path. Um, you were thrown into a class and, and basically walked in and said, well, I don't know much about this, but we'll learn together. And, and this work that has really uh, occupied your lives, literally, um, and, and not just your personal lives, your work lives, they're, they're intermeshed. I mean, they're, I, I don't, you probably can't see where they uh, divide. Um, you say at times it's all consuming. It's, uh, there was a time you used to say, oh, I don't know if I can continue to do this anymore and now you say what's next. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure what happened with that exactly except that I, I suddenly realized in the past couple of years that when I feel most engaged in the world is when I'm looking in somebody's eyes and they're telling me a story and they're telling me their story and I suddenly feel like I actually started to realize that I feel like I'm stargazing. You know, I imagine, I imagine myself as an astronomer just looking up at the heavens and just being in this place of wonder. And that's what I realized was happening for me. So I was always trying to figure out why am I doing this? What's, what's next in, you know, in terms of detail? And then I realized it doesn't matter because I'm just, I just want to get to the next 
galaxy. Yeah. And the way kids, the way students talk about this, they talk about this class, not all of them, but, but mm -hmm. a good number of them talk about this class as life-changing, as I, I, I can't believe I thought this or that I now think this, or, um, but, but they leave, mm -hmm. I think, a little different, at least a little different. Mm -hmm. No, the, most of them do. I mean, it's, it's a humbling experience for us, and, and certainly for me, um, to think, how is it that this this guy from Toledo, this ordinary human working class kid from Toledo could grow up and have, you know, have an impact on, on students. But then, you know, I, it happened to me you know, my, in my third year of college. Um, Your third year and you were still basically a freshman. I was still very much a freshman <laughs> and, I, and I had transferred to a two-year community college. So I was really about one day and in the middle of a quarter it was, I was about one day away from dropping out and, and I just had an awakening. And, and it, it was, was sociology. It led me to social work, actually, and then ultimately I said, no, this isn't interesting enough, and then to sociology, but I absolutely changed my path. I mean, it was a 180, and, and so when I'm teaching, when I'm talking in that class, I'm speaking to myself, and, I'm, and, and to those people sitting often in the back of the room or on the sides of the room who, are, who, are, who haven't woken up yet, and I'm trying to just bring life to them because this th learning and the university life and thinking it's so amazing it's so wonderful um, and and students respond I mean you know they, they get a lot of negative flap but um, but they respond talk about these conversations because what you've tried to do is create a space where people can talk about things that they've never felt comfortable talking about before mm. can I I just, I kind of um, want to go along with what Sam was just saying because it connects to the conversation. I feel like for me, in the spaces of the conversation, it doesn't, it doesn't matter what the topic is. I believe so deeply that just by listening to what you have to say and you listening to what I have to say, that we can crack into something and see the whole world differently. It doesn't happen every time, it, and who knows how often it happens. It happens enough that keep me going, but I know that it's happened to me enough that it doesn't matter the conversation. It's just that the, the big questions are the ones that get people more sitting up in their seats and paying attention. And so I think at one level, the university has just given us the mission by saying, hey, teach this class. On another level, I just believe because of what I've experienced that it just takes a conversation to, to change the way you see the world. For you mm -hmm. to step into someone else's shoes mm. for just a moment for just a moment that's all it takes and yeah, then life is different momentary. life is different after that you know and this is the key this is why we operate with with um, by casting a wide net so we have these are 90 minute conversations and we do over a thousand a year I mean this is aside from the social 19 class all everything that happens in there but what we're trying to do is just wake people up just create a spark and and once this that you know the the, the spark goes off then it's more likely to create another one and another and so on as opposed to a smaller number of students for very extensive conversations over the course of an entire semester or a year of course we do that in the class but this is with the world in conversation project we're going for that spark and it happens so often it's it's really it's humbling once again you uh, have, have traveled quite widely to mm -hmm. uh, Latin America, throughout the United States, to Japan, Haiti, Israel, um, and Ecuador, places like that. Talk, if you would, about race and how it's viewed in other countries. How does the United States uh, compare? Mm. Well, I think for us, it's just, uh, it's always a filter for people. In every culture, race is a filter, difference. And so people see difference, and it, and it does impact people everywhere in the world. In the United States, it's just a, it's a filter that's a little bit thicker than other ones, and it's certainly one that, that we're reticent to talk about. We're told not to talk about it, certainly white people, um, that if we do talk about it, it means something about us, maybe that we're racist. or If you that, notice it. If we notice it. If we see color, right, that's, that's not a good thing. And so this is part one of the problems in, in our culture is that white people are, we're teaching one another to not notice race and people of color are saying, well, but you know, this is part of me. And so we're kind of, we're coming up against one another in, in a way that doesn't really lead to authentic conversation or a desire for conversation. But I think in other parts, so here, it's just one of those things that we stumble over, I think, more than other places. But I think I'm starting to think that 
maybe we stumble over it more, but I, I think it's because we're dealing with it more directly. And I think mm -hmm. I, I think I want to say that we're a little more advanced than a lot of other places. I'm surprised when I go to other places and you know how um, unaware different people are of the implications of what they've just said about another group, where I think we're very aware here of, of the implications. Um, and I think we're always, the media is always showing us ways in which um, it's, it's problematic and people are offended by things other people say, and that's of course happening. But I've, I've, I've come to the place where I'm thinking, we actually are really addressing it in, in a way, maybe as best as humans know how to do at this point. So I, I feel positive about that. In actually. fact, I, I went out into a website called Ask a Korean, and he says the United States is the least racist country in the world mm -hmm. because we have more experience with it, because we have a century of experience working with, uh, with a population that is so uh, intermixed, so multicultural. Mm -hmm. I, I thought that was interesting. There's, there's also a, a survey, the Human Beliefs and Values Surveys. Uh, it's a twice a decade survey of social and political attitudes. And according to this, the most bigoted country in the Western world is Ireland. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, Scandinavian yeah. countries, the least so. Yeah, interesting. Um, yeah, and again, you know, there's the there's kind of the the political correctness aspect there, right? I mean, it, it's one thing; it's what we say in our upfront conversations, but what we're what you really have to get at is what's going on in the back of people's minds. So, mm -hmm. what we see day in and day out is that people have one level of discourse that they engage in with others in a public sphere, but you know, when they're at home in the quiet of their of their their you know, room, maybe with their friends and so on, there's often a very different conversation and that's the one that we want to get at in our conversation. Yeah, our that's, that's definitely the work, but I would also say it's not so, such a dichotomy between, you know, what you're willing to say and what you're not willing to say. I think what, I, what I've come to through so many years of these conversations is that we actually believe that we think that everybody's equal or that we believe that we all have a fair chance. We believe it. I mean, a lot, I would say young people believe it. They've been taught that. So it's not that they're, you know, I, my, in my experience is it's not that they're, they're hiding what they really believe. I mean, mm -hmm. sometimes that's true, but mostly it's not. Mostly it's they don't know what they really believe until they actually have to, have to speak it. Um, so I find that actually the most interesting to get to that. In your book, Making Peace Between the Colors, you talk about how difficult it is for white Americans to even bring up the issue of race. Mm -hmm. And you say that there's this unspoken belief that blacks are better at it. Is, is that the case? Better at bringing up the conversation? Absolutely. I mean, because I think people who are not in the white majority are always talking about their position in the world and the way the system is affecting them. I mean, they're in their families as they're growing up. This is just part of the dialogue. So for them, it's very natural to keep talking about that. Whereas for most white people, it's, it's the very opposite, you know, to be in an educated person and to be a moral person, it's, that's not something that you really need to pay attention to. This is not important. And so for us to actually have that conversation is very, very different and, and has very different meaning. And, and white Americans are actually afraid that they will be perceived as racist. Absolutely. And I think that when we have conversations, we push, well, what are you afraid of? That I might offend somebody. But what if you did offend somebody? I don't know, I would just defend them. There's, so the reason I'm saying that is because I sometimes think that there's just something injected into our veins that tells us not to do this, but no one really seems to know why when pushed to the, to the edge of that. It's just something we don't do. I, I was reading about one of your classes where a, a girl tearfully was talking about um, and admitting, I guess, confessing to her classmates that her friends were very racist, her, her family was very racist, and one of the black students in the class said, what took you so long to talk about this? Right, mm -hmm. right, right. It's not a big deal. I mean, to black and brown people. I mean, it is, but it's not. It's understood that this is what happens. But, but you know, white, white people, we carry a lot. We carry a lot of guilt. We carry a lot of burden about it. And even though we, de we often deny the guilt, we'll say, well, I don't feel guilty about this. But we do. It's deep, it's deep within us. And we don't know how to how to bring it out and how to put it out into the, onto the table and have real honest and critical conversation about it. Well, and the other complication too is um, a lot of people of color, especially if people who don't grow up with white people, they have been taught that white people are bigots and racists and all of these things and so they're expecting it and ex expecting that mm -hmm. and so if, you're, if they are with white people who aren't sharing those kinds of thoughts, 
they just believe that they're hidden somewhere in them. Sure. And so that, that just, it gets very sticky and messy because sometimes that's true and sometimes it's not true and sometimes it looks differently than you might expect it to look. Or, sure, white, so pe white people that don't talk about race are not talking about it because they're, they're closet racist. Yeah. Oh. See and how so, that works, and so yeah. It's like, so it's, oh no, it's not like that. I mean, it's really so. Really, the, the 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 most important and the deepest conversations are really in this this very nuanced realm. It's not the racist, the extreme racist, or the extreme non-racist, whatever those two terms actually ultimately mean, but it's really just in the middle, that, that middle ground. And in fact, you say it's difficult for you as a, a white woman to really understand it because you've never walked in the shoes. You know, you'd have to be uh, the, the, uh, the man in black like me to really experience what it is in this country, for example, to be black. Right, but what, I, what I've come to is that what I realize is I know what it's like to be in the majority and I know what it's like to change my mind. I know what it's like to grow up thinking uh, these bad people and these are people you don't want to be with and yet think of myself as a good person, as a moral person. How, can, how does a person do that, right? I know, I know about that, so I, I don't know about the experience of being the racial minority, but I definitely know about being in the majority and how you can have this split mind and, st and be okay with yourself. And so for me, that's a really powerful piece in, in, this, in this work. And, and people, according to a, a Tufts University study, um, whites can be strategically colorblind. Mm. Uh, they, they did um, an exercise where they asked two people to try to identify someone they were thinking about, a celebrity. And it might have been, it would have been very helpful to know, is this person black or white, male or female? And the whites never even broached the subject of race mm -hmm. until they felt safe to do it. And that was after the black participant brought it up first. Sure. I talk about, that all the time. Yeah, I talk about how one of the best indicators of how comfortable a person is with race is how often they use racial signifiers when they don't need to and how often they don't use them when they actually would be very helpful. So, you know, do I say, well, the Mexican guy or the Indian woman, and when I, it has nothing, no bearing on the story whatsoever, or do I not say it, when in fact, it, in this case, it would be very, very helpful. And that's a great indicator of how comfortable we are with race. You mentioned the word racial majority, and that brings us to something else, because one of the things you ask your students is, what does it mean to be white in America? Mm -hmm. and, and students play with that concept. By 2040 or 2050, maybe even 2060, it won't be a white majority. Mm -hmm. Yeah, things will change. I mean, many things won't change. I mean, if you ask people, they, they, they have an idea often that, this, that the United States will be turned on its head. But by and large, things won't look that different. I mean, you know, the, we'll see. What do you mean things won't look that different? Well, I mean, you know, certainly power and, and wealth and so on will mostly be in the hands of, of uh, the people that hold power and wealth today. I mean, it's slowly changing, right? But, uh, but I think when you bring the economic aspect in, I mean, it, it, we see that not, not a great deal is going to change. But what we will see are, are, is a greater inclusion of different cultures and different perspectives. I mean, there'll be so more Spanish-speaking people. So you don't Spanish think a post-white majority will be that, that different? No, I don't think so. Well, well, more people will be learning Spanish and Chinese. I mean, that's for certain. And, and we'll want to, and we'll see that as a very positive option. Yeah, I think that's very much true. Something that you do called the Christian Invaders, uh, mm -hmm. a video where you get your students to think about the information that, that Muslims are getting, for example, and, mm -hmm. and how they're perceiving the United States. Mm -hmm. It's really mm -hmm. an interesting, provocative um, presentation. Yeah, it's actually very simple. I mean, it's, in it some ways, it's, it's the, the, the most the simplistic lecture or presentation I've ever done, but all, but in many ways the most powerful. And yeah, put ourselves in the shoes of an Arab Muslim living in Iraq and, and see what you would think about this war and the invasion. And um, it has a very profound impact on students. And, and it's not, you know, it's not anti-American. It's not an attempt to really undermine our political system or even critique the United States. It's just, look, do a mind exercise. And, you know, and I take, take Arab Muslims living in Iraq because it is, especially the people who are we identify as the terrorists because it, it's those people that we're allowed to hate we're told that we should hate them and that we're congratulated for hating them and so if we can step into the shoes of our enemies and we can just for a moment see the world from their perspective and see that maybe I can understand how they might think in the way they do well that's really powerful for every other aspect of our lives and I think there's something though really 
I mean, we can say it that it's it's a thought experiment and it's not anti-American, and we can say all of those things. But what I know is that when we walk into and I'll say enemy territory, th that's a very political act. And so, just the idea of asking someone to take on the perspective of somebody else who is considered an enemy. That's not something that we do easily or lightly, and then very often you become the enemy if you actually are at or asking mm -hmm. somebody else. You're, you're asking someone to do that, and so it's very tricky territory. And I think the ability of this of our students and the willingness of them to actually participate in those kinds of thought experiments and those kinds of conversations is profound. And um, I don't know, there's a, there's a potential for changing the world in that, and I'm, sometimes um, we don't really want to change the world. But for me, the, d the deepest part of this is just that there's so many reasons not to listen to, to somebody else, because then our team is going to actually, um, what's the word I'm looking for, abandon us, potentially. Mm. Because you're no longer on our team if you can understand what they think. Yeah, you're with us or you're with the enemy. Yeah, it's, it's pretty much and, that. We don't have and, categories. And it's really for... looking at, you know, one man's uh, freedom fighter is another man's terrorist. Yeah. And, and yeah. so. But, the, you know, the key here, though, is, is our work is built on the Socratic method. It's, it's, it's not politicized. I mean, if, if, well, I suppose that's political in and of itself, Everything right? Everything's political, yeah. But we're, but we're selecting facilitators and we're selecting a team of people who want authentic conversation. They don't want to teach, they don't want to tell the world how it is and how they should think and how they should be and act and so on. But really, they want to sit down with a group of people and ask questions. Now, what do you really think about that? And so even that lecture, I mean, in some ways, that's, that's kind of one of the more political things that we do, but he's, but really, we are about conversation and Socratic conversation. And, and so we, we, want, we want the authentic dialogue to emerge, whatever that is. Does your class, uh, p students talk about being changed, about a, many of them saying it's the best class they've ever taken, um, but does it change behavior? Well, it, sure it does. I mean, how much behavior does it change? That's hard to say. I mean, I. We know a couple things. We know that people make friends across lines that they wouldn't otherwise make friends with, and then where that leads, you know, is where that leads. We also know that people um, decide to take on positions and jobs and majors and careers that, were, according to them, are different than they would have been otherwise. And so we definitely see those behavior changes, at least in the context that we're in. Mm -hmm. and, I, and they seem like they're, those are pretty, pretty big. And yeah. also, what I, a thing that we hear a lot is um, among our facilitators anyway is that they start to facilitate their friends and so they begin to have dialogue where they might otherwise just turn away from things. So those are real differences. A lot of ripples. Yeah, uh, through, yeah definitely. Through. I mean, um, I, I would say it changes people as much as any single class of, its, of this type could. I mean, I, th I think that is probably the case. You describe yeah. sociology to your students as this invisible force that shapes humans. And mm -hmm. I'm wondering to what extent um, can you not, you know, I think of uh, my colleagues, they can't watch a movie without seeing cuts or camera mm. moves and those sorts of things. My guess is that you two cannot function in the world without seeing, without not seeing the invisible forces mm. shaping behaviors and, and the way we feel about things and kind of dissecting um, why things are done the way they are. Is, is that accurate? It is. <laughs> and it, it enters into every aspect of our lives 24-7. I mean, we're constantly engaged in conversation and dialogue and observation. Yeah, or, or just in the moment when, when I think maybe I have some kind of interaction with someone that just goes bad and, and I think, just in the moment when I think, ah, it's this, it's because of that, and I could stand on that and then I think, oh no, but wait a second, it's this kind of person and they had this kind of experience and they probably are thinking, and so suddenly I can't can't stand on my platform anymore. That's happening all the time. Sure, Lori's having these. We're in, with these Middle East conversations. One thing that we do is we bring Arab Muslim students, mostly mostly Muslim, though some Christian and uh, and some Persian. So I don't know. We bring students from the Middle East together with mm -hmm. American students, not of Middle Eastern ancestry, and they engage in in these 90-minute conversations. And we've done this past year. We did about a hundred of those. And um, so Lori has a, a, a two, an hour and a half meeting with Middle Eastern students with say 15 of them and it's in, in engaging in conversation and it's just learning so many things about 
this this other culture about other people and the way people see the world and, and it's once you do that and you sit down for that kind of level of discourse and conversation you never see the world the same again and I hear people you know I'll read on, uh, on websites and blogs people talking about the Middle East and what they know and what they think and I think man you need to sit in my wife's shoes for a semester and really hear how people think and then you know you will really shift the way you you perceive the world. Mm -hmm. Well, let's end with two things. One is, what advice would you give to someone who wants to start one of these conversations and isn't finding it easy going? Well, to start a specific conversation. Well, a, a conversation about no, not a specific, but a conversation about race or you know these mm -hmm. these difficult social issues yeah. that we find so difficult to talk about. Well, so for so it would probably so for a white person. I would say um, you, that you need be prepared to stumble, be prepared to to struggle, be, to be misunderstood, be prepared to be misunderstood. <laughs> just like black and brown people are misunderstood all the time, um, and it's not. And, and white people aren't used to that. Be prepared to be seen as a representative of your entire group. That's not what happens as a white person. See me as an individual. Um, but when you engage in the race dialogue, the race conversation, these are the things that happen. So you have to be prepared for that. And if you are and you really want to grow, um, well, just be ready to, to be, you know, going down a river and just keep hitting the, the rapids and the rocks and so on. And it's going to take a while. That's what I would say. And be prepared for your life to change. Yeah. And on that note, we're out of time. Thank you very much for, for talking with us. Thank Absolutely. you. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Sam Richards and Lori Mulvey. Comcast subscribers can watch this program anytime on Penn State On Demand. Find out how through our website, conversations.psu.edu, where you'll also find more information and videos on the World in Conversation project. I'm Patty Satalia. We hope you'll join us for our next conversation from Penn State. If you would like to purchase a DVD of this or any episode of Conversations from Penn State, order online at mediasales.psu.edu or call 1-800-770-2111. Production funding provided in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by viewers like you. Thank you. This has been a production of WPSU.